Welcome again to our Building Family Bonds Learn to Talk to Your Child About Your Mental Health Condition webinar. My name is Angie Day. I am the Chapter and Volunteer Services Director at DBSA and will be moderating this webinar. Our speaker, Evan Kaplan, uh, is from Child and Family Connection. He shared this bio. Evan and his daughter co-founded Child and Family Connections, the first nonprofit dedicated exclusively to parental mental illness. CFC improves the lives of families living with parental mental illness in meaningful ways through peer-informed education, advocacy, and support. Evan is a frequent speaker at conferences, in classrooms, and at community events. Evan and Charlotte are the recipients of the Duro Community of Hope Award. He is a graduate of the Executive Leadership Program at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, a graduate of Bryn Mawr College's nonprofit Executive Leadership Institute, and a certified peer specialist. He earned his bachelor's degree in English from the Pennsylvania State University. Welcome, Evan. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Thanks, Angie. It's great to be here. So I, I appreciate everybody that's on the line and uh, dialed in for the webinar. This is a topic that is very near and dear to my, my heart um, and a really critical one, especially for those people who are parents. Uh, but I do want to make a note about DBSA just very briefly. When I was going through a, a very difficult time uh, with my mental health and, and just my situation in general not that long ago, uh, there's a DBSA group in Philadelphia where I'm from, and it was really a lifesaver for me. It was the one place that I could go on a regular basis, see the same faces, and find some, some pretty great support. So DBSA for me has a, a, a place in my heart, for sure. Uh, I'm here to talk about talking about mental illness or mental health challenges or mental health conditions. Uh, depending on what your preference is linguistically, and I'm going to talk a little bit about language uh, at another point. I wanted to share with you a uh, quote that I, I turn to quite often. It's from C.S. Lewis of all people, and he says, I have learned now that while those who speak about one's misery usually hurt, and those who keep silent hurt even more. And I could not agree more with C.S. Lewis. I want to share a story, it's my story, with you, and there's a reason for it. It's not to be self-congratulatory uh, or to hear myself talk, but as the presentation goes on, I think this will, will begin to make more sense. Um, so I, I'm, I grew up in a middle class, upper middle class white family in uh, New England. There was nothing particularly different or interesting about us on the outside, but on the inside, uh, I grew up in a home where there was a lot of mental illness throughout our, our family, and, and both sides, in fact. And I was a pretty difficult child with a lot of behavioral problems, and I was in therapy as a very, very young kid, and this is back in the 70s. And when my mom used to get mad at me, she would, talk, she would tell us this story, my sister and I, about a bathtub, a dead body, and a teenage girl. And that's that story would come in bits and pieces. I wasn't quite sure what it meant, but I knew she said it when she was upset or angry with me. And that's something that stayed with me, obviously. Uh, when I turned 32, I was first diagnosed with bipolar disorder, 32 years later, in fact. Um, and I was at sort of the peak of my career. I had just gotten married. I had a house. I was running a new business that was very, very successful. Um, things were going phenomenally. I had a little baby uh, who was a year and a half old at that time. And then things turned much for the worst. I had been on a manic run for about a year. Uh, at the end of it, I was not married. I did not have a business anymore. I was persona non grata at a lot of the stores and hotels and restaurants in Philadelphia. Oftentimes I couldn't understand why they didn't want me to come in. Um, I had no recollection. And I became very, very depressed, as often happens with, with bipolar disorder after a, a long mania. Um, and I had a suicide attempt. It uh, was my first suicide attempt. It was one of, of several. Um, and I ended up in a coma in the hospital at Hahnemann University here in Philadelphia. 
And for five days, they weren't sure whether I was going to make it or not, but I did. And because I had nowhere to go, I had no home anymore and no family to speak of, I signed over power of attorney for my health care decisions and for my financial decisions to my parents, and then they institutionalized me. So I spent a year in a, um, a home for people with serious and persistent mental illness, as they called it, um, and really went through my first couple of rounds of, of trying different combinations of medication for bipolar disorder and ADHD, which is my other um, diagnosis. And I felt like I was coming and going some days. I was taking medication to help me wake up in the morning because the side effects were making me tired of the other medications and then medications to help me get to sleep and for weight loss. And it was just around and around and around. Um, I decided after a year that I had had enough even though I had no access to uh, my funds or to make a whole lot of decisions on behalf of myself. But I went to Florida, had a second suicide attempt, and when I came back, um, I had absolutely nowhere to go. My parents wouldn't take me. Uh, the, the facility that I had been living in did not want me back. I was a liability and a risk to them. And so I ended up living in a halfway house for a while. I was destitute at another point in time. I was um, the homeless guy that you see sort of wandering around the neighborhood. Um, and something that my mother had said to me, in fact, on the way back, on the flight back from Florida, she was with me. She said, Evan, do not leave that child with the legacy of a parent who didn't love her enough to live. Do not leave that child with the legacy of a parent who didn't love her enough to live. And I realized at that time that she was talking not just about my daughter, Charlotte, but about her own life, and that the bathtub and the dead body and the teenage girl were my mom's experience with mental illness. She came home from school and found her mother uh, passed away from a suicide attempt or a suicide uh, in the bathtub. And I made the decision uh, at that point, literally at that, that moment, that I was not going to put my daughter through the same situation and the same loss and the same lifetime of problems that losing a parent can, can create. And so I dug myself out of my rather wretched situation. It took many, many years. And I was rebuilding my relationship with my daughter over many years. And one day we were in family therapy together, and she said, I don't like the decisions that my daddy makes because he has a mental illness. And I was flabbergasted. I, I felt like I had been kicked in the, in the stomach. I had never told Charlotte that I had a mental health condition, never discussed it with her. She was really young at the time. You know, she knew I had health care problems, but I never used those words. And I was blown away by the fact that, A, she, she knew it, and B, she was really angry and resentful. And I could tell that she had a lot of misinformation and some misunderstanding, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. But what I did decide to do was to begin talking to Charlotte about my mental health as, as well as I could as, you know, I'm not a, a professional trained mental health uh, professional. I, I did the best I could. We would talk about it. You know, if something came up on TV, sometimes she would ask about my medication. She was a pretty good student. And one day, after a number of years, she came to me and she said, Daddy, I wish there were other kids I could talk to who also have a parent with a mental health condition. And I thought, wow, we've come a long way from that little girl who was angry to a place where I think I had done a pretty good job of helping her understand not just mental health, but me as well. And she came to me and, and she was interested in exploring more. And so I took Charlotte's request very seriously. Um, and I tried to find a program to meet her needs in Philadelphia. I found nothing. I tried to find a program to meet her needs nationally and I found nothing. And I ran into and, and found some really wonderful people who were interested in much of the same things. Uh, parents, their children, and parents with mental health conditions in particular, and we started a nonprofit called Child and Family Connections. 
and I think as Angie had read, our mission is to improve the lives of families living with parental mental health conditions in meaningful ways. We do it through peer support, informed education, advocacy, and support. And our goal as an organization is, number one, a world where people are not stigmatized um, for having a mental health condition, and that mental health is treated like all the other medical uh, ailments or illnesses and with the same amount of resources. Um, and our, our goal is to really build a system of care around parents who have a mental health condition, their children, and their families. So let me talk a little bit about parents. It's uh, not a topic that comes up very often, uh, but we are parents, those of us that have mental health conditions just like you. We deal with the same issues, the kids, the car, getting them to school, difficult teenagers, you know, making lunch, all of those things that other parents deal with, and we just happen to have a mental health challenge or condition. But it does get in the way for a lot of us. Sometimes depression or medication side effects make getting the kids to school really difficult. In other cases, you know, we may be hospitalized uh, for periods, and that can be devastating for a family, and certainly in your function as a parent. And it gets in the ways, a lot of other, other ways, from relationship uh, perspectives. So there is a, a real crisis that's happening with parents with a mental health condition. There are a lot of us. The, you know, the ranges from research are anywhere from 5 to 10 million parents. Um, and 67% are mothers, 75% are fathers. We die, unfortunately, 25 years earlier on average. We lose custody of our children 70 to 80% of the time, according to um, some research done in New York. And only one-third of our children are living with us at a given point in time. And unfortunately, and this is where the kind of work that I'm doing comes in and the kind of work that Angie and DBSA are doing, we often don't get support until we're in a legal situation or there's welfare involvement. There's very little intervention or proactive work being done around parents with mental health conditions and their families. So we're not just the ones at risk, but our children are as well. Uh, there are a number of risk factors. Uh, they range from environmental to belief-based to genetic. Um, and risk factors, for those who are not aware, are uh, situations, environments, or behaviors that put a person at risk in this context at least, of having a greater uh, likelihood of having a mental health condition of their own. And what that means is that those variables impact our children and may make a difference in terms of their long-term mental health. So, so what are the impact of, of these risk factors? Um, two times 200% uh, or Twice as many uh, children live below the poverty level that have parents with mental health conditions. They have a 20 to 25% greater rate of unemployment when they become adults. So we're talking about the children. They have a 76 greater percentage or risk of having food insecurity or not having enough food. And they're three times more likely to be involved in welfare services. Those are, those are pretty scary, pretty daunting numbers. And so, I, I hope at least I've convinced you that, um, you know, parenting with a mental health, health condition is something that we really need to take very seriously for our own health, but also for, for our children's as well. So I have a question for you. I guess it's rhetorical given the, the format. The question is, how likely are children who have one or both parents with a mental health condition to develop a mental health condition of their own and a serious one? Um, you may be surprised, and I would love to hear some feedback from people at the end if they have questions or comments, but the likelihood that a child will have uh, their own serious mental health condition if one or both of the parents have one themselves is 41 to 77 percent, and obviously it goes up with having one versus two parents. So that is a, a genetic risk that these children are born with right from the get-go, from the very beginning. 
and in some ways the odds are stacked a little bit against them. Fortunately, however, there are some things that we can do as parents. There's a lot of things we can do. The one I'm going to focus on is talking to our children about our mental health. Um, there's been a, a reasonable amount of research done in this area by a colleague of mine, Joanne Nicholson at Dartmouth, and uh, Bill Beardsley at Harvard, and I'll provide some citations and some suggestions uh, if you're interested in finding out about the, the research that's being done. But what we know definitively is that when families talk about mental health, and particularly around uh, parental mental health, but this could be applied to talking to children about their own mental health as well, it bolsters protective factors. Those are the things that keep our children well and safe and healthy. It reduces the risk factors that I had just uh, mentioned. It fosters trust within the family. It strengthens the relationships. It creates a team that may not have existed before. It brings together a bond within the family going through a shared experience, a shared set of problem solving. Um, and in the end of it all, I've seen that it really helps families find hope, or at least more hope, where maybe there wasn't a lot there um, to begin with. What I've seen firsthand and I'll, I'll point out this picture of Michael, who, who I do know. He was in our first workshop in 2012. He came with his mother who was diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia, if I recall. She did not have custody of Michael. And when he arrived in the classroom the first time, he was muttering, that woman's crazy, get away from me, some other stuff that I won't repeat. Um, but there was clearly a lot of resentment and anger on his part and a lot of discomfort on his mother's. They didn't really have, from what I could see, a relationship. Over the course of that first kind of experimental program, a couple of things happened. By the midpoint, Michael and his mom were sitting and having dinner together and laughing. That was rather a remarkable step. And when we had our last session, and we were sort of quote-unquote graduating, Michael put his arm around his mother, and it was the most breathtaking moment that I've seen in, in the work that I've done in direct services, to have come from that far. Um, and, and the other thing I want to point out, that this was a mother who didn't have custody, lived in a very dangerous neighborhood, was ridiculed by her neighbors, often wasn't able to afford her own medication, so she may have been dealing with side effects or she may have been dealing with uh, the symptoms themselves. She came every week and she got on that, that subway with Michael. She must have picked him up somewhere. And I can imagine the silence that they sat in on the way down, at least in those first couple of weeks. Um, and that was what gave me the motivation, quite frankly, to want to continue to do this work uh, beyond that first pilot workshop. So one of the things I get asked a lot are, what is it that kids want to know? A lot of the questions they have are around safety. They're around themselves, especially with younger children. They see themselves at the center of the world. And so a lot of what's happening revolves around them. Uh, there's a, a lot of misinformation, like my daughter had. Uh, there's a lot of information that they don't quite understand, which I will uh, talk about in a moment. So the questions run from why are you acting the way that you're acting, mom or dad, to whose responsibility is it? Is this something you could catch? Did I give this to you? Did I do something wrong as a child that caused you to develop a mental health condition or to act the way that you're acting? Are you taking drugs that uh, are causing you to act this way because I've seen my parent, you know, take things, you know, out of the medicine cabinet. Um, to things like, why didn't I know this myself? And as we talk a little bit about age differences, the older children's questions will obviously be more sophisticated, uh, but at the root of it are the same sort of basic fears or basic principles. Is everything going to be okay? Am I safe? Do you still love me? Um, 
I need more information about this, this mental health condition. Um, am I the only person in the world that's dealing with it? And I think from, from you know, elementary school up through teenagers and young adults, the, the core of those kind of questions remains the same. And so as parents, those are the types of uh, issues that we want to address while we think about talking to our children. I'm going to um, share a little bit about our options here because as parents, we do have the choice to not talk about uh, our mental health. It's a difficult topic. Um, it's the kind of thing that is a little yucky for a lot of people or maybe a lot of yucky for little people. I don't know. Um, but it, it's not something that comes naturally or easily. But when we don't talk about it, when we leave silence, we are essentially concealing something that's important to our everyday lives from our children. And I will tell you almost without fail, children are aware. We may not talk to them about it. We may not show them anything about our mental health, but children have a great understanding and a great feeling of awareness, even if they can't articulate or quite put their finger on it. And so it, we, we are not filling in the information appropriately for our children, um, and we're giving them an opportunity to go out and find that information elsewhere as opposed to hearing it from, from ourselves. And what it does is it does the, what, what happened with Charlotte, a lot of mistrust and resentment and fear and confusion. And frankly, the less that those children know about your mental health when they have an awareness, the, the more problematic it becomes because there's more gaps for them to, to fill in. Young children tend to tell themselves stories and typically self-blame um, when they are unsure. And so if they're aware that you, you are having some kind of a, a condition or an illness, children will put themselves at the center of that blame, as in, I probably caused my mom or dad's issues. Um, older children will seek out information from places that we really would prefer that they don't. It could be, you know, kids talking on the street, the internet, social media. Sometimes it can be a, um, an ex or a spouse or a significant other. That information could very easily be biased. At the core of it, we don't know what our children know unless we take that step to, to speak with them. So there's, there's a lot of reasons why parents are resistant. Um, they, they really kind of fall into two categories from my perspective. There's the practical explanations, and then there's the enculturated uh, uh, implications and, and re reasoning. The practical are things like, I don't know what to say, or um, my kids don't need to know, they're not age appropriate, or... Um, I don't know enough about my own condition, or it would only cause them more undue stress. The deeper issues oftentimes are around the enculturated uh, issues, such as religious, um, cultural, societal taboos, stigma. Uh, a lot of, like my family, for example, we had a lot of generational issues, meaning that my mom's family before me didn't talk about mental illness in her family. We didn't talk about it in my family. And fortunately, I was able to try to break that, that, chain, uh, that, uh, that chain of events. Um, but those are very deep-rooted feelings and thoughts and beliefs that we have. Um, and a lot of times, we have to overcome those or take steps that other people in our families may not be willing to take to overcome those, those barriers, but, they, but it can be done. So why is it important that we talk about mental health with our kids? There's a lot of considerations. But at the, you know, at the core of, of this consideration piece, mental health, parental mental health happens within the family, and our kids are exposed to it. It's a family issue, and oftentimes it becomes a family problem and it becomes an opportunity for the family to solve and come up with solutions as well. Um, sometimes children absolutely need to be involved. 
especially with older children that maybe care, you know, with, that have younger siblings, we may need our children to, to step in occasionally if we're not feeling well. And so they have a right and a need to, to know the facts and the details about our health. Um, by taking responsibility, research has taught us that we as parents have the ability to reduce the risk factors and the likelihood that our children will develop a serious mental illness or condition themselves by 40%. So when I was talking earlier about all of those risk factors, this is one way of decreasing outcomes rather dramatically. And Bill Beardsley at Harvard was the uh, professor and the, um, the doctor who began doing this work on people with mothers with depression in particular. But we have a chance to change the direction of our children's lives now and, and later by 40% by taking some of these sometimes difficult steps, but they're necessary. And then the last piece I'll, I'll, I'll say is, and, and this was my firsthand experience, by not talking to our children, we are creating an opportunity of loss of trust and a loss of respect. And I, I for one, at least believe that we need to treat little people and young people, um, children, with a level of, of respect that, that they deserve, the way that we would want to be treated as well, but in an age-appropriate way. So I'm just going to touch really quickly on, on the workshops that we run because I want to help you understand a little bit about the foundation, and I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But our goal in the program, Building Family Bonds, and our goal in talking about uh, mental illness is ultimately to build resiliency in our children. Resiliency meaning that they have the skills or the tools or the experience or the problem-solving skills to get through difficult times and to bounce back from challenging situations. And so we want to build that resiliency in our children and we want to build it in our family. Families are complex social structures, uh, but there is a cohesive family resilience as well. It's a little bit more difficult to define, but if we can begin to build individual resilience, especially starting with our children, it bolsters our resilience within our families. And the more we talk, the more we can problem solve and address the realities and, and, and what's happening in our lives. So we take an approach called intentional parenting and an approach called learned resiliency. Intentional parenting just means that I make choices about how I parent based on a lot of factors, but I always consider my mental health as being part of it. So it's parenting with deliberation and with education and with knowledge and making the healthy choices for ourselves and for our, our, our children. And then the learned resiliency is, um, resilience is not something you're born with, as some people may believe. It is a set of skills that can be taught. It's a different set of skills for different people in different situations, but it can be taught, it can be learned, and kids have a capacity for being incredibly resilient in the face of really awful situations sometimes. So there's a lot of hope, and that's the, the message that I, I, want to, I really want to share with you. So getting down to kind of brass tacks, uh, how do you go about doing this? The first thing is that we need to plan in advance. If you're going to take it upon yourself to talk about these difficult topics with a lot of emotional weight to them and a lot of fear and a lot of trepidation and stigma, you really should think through how you're going to go about doing this. And the first suggestion that I have for everybody, regardless of whether you're a, you know, a, a mental health professional yourself or not, um, is to get help. And that could be help in many, many different ways. But talking to your children or educating your children about your, your health, your mental health, doesn't have to be something you do alone or exclusively. So if you have a therapist that can help guide you uh, or support you in the process, that's great. If you have a neighbor, a friend, or a spouse, you want to involve them as well to the degree that you're, you're comfortable. But again, this can be a, a family endeavor as much as it can be an individual endeavor. 
Secondly, you need to really know the facts about your own mental health and your diagnosis. So you don't need to you know, uh, be a PhD, but you need to know some of the basic information around what is your diagnosis, what are the treatment options, what are the symptoms, um, what are the signs that you may, be, may not be doing well, really just kind of the fundamentals. You're, you're going to try to debunk some myths that your children or misinformation that your children might have. And you want to be prepared to answer questions when they come up or if they come up. So that's the next one, is to really think about the questions that I had shared earlier that children typically ask. So why are you acting this way? Is it my fault? Can I catch it? Do you still love me? We need to be prepared to, to answer those kind of questions when they come up. And they inevitably will. It may not be uh, in that first conversation that you have, but over time you'll, you'll, you'll start to hear those uh, from your children. Another piece of it is to really think through how and where you're going to do this. Um, I'll talk in a minute about not making a big deal out of it, and that's really important, but you want to you make sure that you broach this topic in a place where your children feel comfortable at a time where they have the attention span um, and you want to make it as soft, caring, and supporting of an environment as possible. You don't want to do it while you're racing to drop the kids off at school, um, but it doesn't have to be a big sit down as well. And then the what if strategies, meaning what's going to happen if as a parent I'm talking to my child and I freeze? or I forget the information that I wanted to share, or, and this is certainly a possibility, something that my child says or does or just the situation triggers me emotionally and I, I'm unprepared. So we want to think about the what if strategies. Um, and some of those can be, you know, learning a little mindfulness if it's something that you're interested in. It can be um, uh, taking a break if you're having that conversation and you really just need to clear your head, or putting the conversation on hold if you need to, um, or you know, practicing something called emotional regulation, which is something that can be learned, and that's just a way of kind of like mindfulness, but of making sure that we're not elevating our own uh, feelings, which is only going to contribute or escalate the, the problem anyway. And then the last part of it is what I call Actually, I don't call it. It's, it's uh, Dr. Dan. He calls it Name It to Tame It. <clears throat> um, and I don't think we can play the video, but I'll click on the slide. Dan Siegel is a professor and a researcher and an MD at UCLA. <clears throat> He's a pretty well-known guy, travels. He's really brilliant, and he has some really great resources on his website. I think it's dansiegel.com, and I'm not promoting him in any way. Um, but he has this program he calls Name It to Tame It. And the, the gist of what he's saying is that if we can craft a narrative around our own mental health story, a personal narrative, it allows us, when we share it with our children, to make sense of it. And some of his research was quite interesting. He found that the best predictor of a, child, a child's mental health in the future is the parent's ability to tell a cohesive story or narrative about the parent's own childhood. So I know that sounds a little bit backwards, but our ability to tell a narrative about our history affects the wellness of our children or indicates, doesn't affect, indicates the wellness of our children in the future. And there are many, many reasons for it, but in particular, in order to craft a narrative and be able to tell a linear, cohesive, understandable, uh, age-appropriate story for our children, we need to really work at it. And we need to think clearly, and we need to have some objectivity uh, from it. And that indicates that the parent is in a pretty good place and able to do some really important work. And so one of the things that I, I wanted to share with you is a tool that we use. It's called uh, My Mental Health Journey. And this is really just a template 
with a, a series of questions to help parents work through developing their own narrative, their name it to tame it, or their mental health journey. Um, it's, it's a daunting task, and it requires sort of sifting through, you know, your past, your experiences. A lot of times we block those things out as parents, or our memories are fuzzy. There are things that we can use to help us, as in asking other people, maybe looking at photographs, um, places that we've been or music that we've heard, all of those can be triggers of sort of recalling. Um, but this is the kind of thing that you want to do when you're feeling pretty good. Because the goal of crafting your personal narrative is to be the hero of your own story. You absolutely have to be the hero of your own story. Because we take a strengths-based strength approach to this. We're crafting a narrative based on our own experience that we want to use to educate and inform our children in a healthy way. So we do not want to tell our children about, you know, my coma or the horrors of, of having a mental health condition or mental illness. We want to touch upon those things that are age appropriate because that's part of the challenge and the journey. But what we really want to focus on is sort of at that top of the pyramid, which is what did I learn what skills or knowledge did I develop? What tools did I acquire? And how am I going to use those moving forward in my life? And by doing so, you're essentially handing your children some of those same tools. So it's not meant to be a war story. It's really meant to be a, 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 a joyful story with some challenges along the way. If anybody's interested in uh, a copy of the template, uh, I'm happy to send you one after the, the uh, presentation. So the question we get is, well, what happens when my child absolutely positively won't talk? First thing is to, to figure out why, what's going on with your child. Sometimes they're more willing to tell you the, the why as to sort of the what. Um, try, you know, a different approach at a different time. Find a different environment. Come back to it. Uh, maybe take a different tact. This is a lifetime of conversations. This is not a one-time end-all, be-all. This is the beginning of a dialogue in your relationship that needs to unfold over your lifetimes, really. Um, and as you get older and as your relationships with your children change, the conversations will change. They'll need to change. And you'll want them to change. Um, it's important to let kids know that this is a topic that you are open to, that they can come to you anytime if they want to talk about it, um, and that you're happy to, to listen. And if you're really having trouble, maybe find another adult or a therapist that might uh, be able to help. So some of the principles of these conversations, you want to be active but present, meaning it's okay to do something while you're talking. You know, it, it's okay to play a game. It's okay to watch TV together or in between, you know, commercials. Media is actually a really good way to initiate some of the conversation. You want to make sure that you are doing more active listening than you are activity and that it is a conducive environment for you both. Um, but it's okay. You don't need to sit down face-to-face -face and have that, that conversation. So a little mental health humor maybe, but don't be too active. Um, but, but definitely be present. So our recommendation to parents is to take that narrative that they've worked on, you know, maybe over a period of time, and share their story. And I've seen parents do many, many interesting, wonderful things with their story. I've had parents that wrote rap songs about it. I've had parents that have texted it over a period of days to their children. I had a mother that... Uh, wrote her, her, her narrative down, put it in an envelope, mailed it to herself, knowing that her son opens her mail. I took the, the sort of straightforward route, which is to write a letter to my daughter, um, telling her the things that I wanted her to know. And she took it quietly, didn't respond all that much. A couple of years later, she mentioned the letter to me and that she still had it. So children listen. They hear what we're saying, even if necessarily they don't react in the way that we, we want. 
and we have to allow them to, to react. You could get silence, you could get tears, you could get a big hug, you could get, I knew that mommy or daddy, I, I've been waiting for you to tell me, any number of responses. But keep in mind that if they're responding in some way, they've heard what you've said. And so we give children time to process that information. We want to make sure as we're interacting, talking about mental health, that we validate children's feelings, particularly feelings that they might have about us and about our mental, our mental illness and maybe our behavior, right? So we want them to understand that we know where they're coming from, and especially teenagers have a very difficult time accepting that. And so I think it's helpful to give them um, some of your own experiences that might emotionally match up with, with what they're feeling. It's okay for kids to get angry or be upset or resentful. I think kids need to know that, but they also need to know, on the other hand, that the behavior as a result of it needs to be appropriate, right? It's how we manage those feelings. Um, we don't want to make excuses for our mental health. But if we've done or said hurtful things or made mistakes, we need to admit them and own up to them and move on. And we want to address shame and stigma with that last sentence, it's difficult not to worry about what other people think. And I'm going to come to that in just a moment. So part of our responsibility with talking about mental health is to find out what our children actually know. Um, and we don't want to make any assumptions uh, children know more than we think they do typically. We talked a little bit, or I talked a little bit about where that information can come from, but we want to be very, very clear so that we can really debunk any myths, we can correct any misinformation, and that we are talking from the same base of understanding that our children have and that they have with us. We need a common language. So we ask, you know, what do you know? What do you want to know that you don't already know? What have you noticed? What have you seen? And how do you feel about all of this? Now, these are pretty heavy, pretty heavy questions, I realize. So part of our job, and, and we talked about this in preparation, is to share factual information. So tell them about your illness, the symptoms, the diagnosis, how it's treated, and you want to be complete and you want to be honest about all of that. To do anything less is going to set back uh, the progress that you're making and, and the relationship. But we, again, we do it in an age-appropriate way. We want to stress safety, number one safety. And, and I think this is a great verbatim quote. You have a right to feel safe. And that means even from us if you're feeling unsafe. If my mental health as a parent makes my daughter feel uncomfortable, she has a place to go and people to call, and I have taken upon myself and, and teach that we have to sort of, what, for lack of a better way to put it, we need to suck it up. It may be hurtful, you know, it may you know, spark our own negative feelings. You know, we may feel inadequate, but children need that safe place and we need to give them the tools so they need to be able to say that they're feeling uncomfortable. They need to be able to reach out to other people. And we want to let children know that, that we have an emergency plan. And if we don't have one, maybe we can put one together. I'm, gonna, I'm winding up here. So we want children to know that they're not alone. They are not the only kids in the world that have a parent with a mental health condition. Um, there's a lot of literature on the web, and I'm happy to send you stuff as well, and there's some books. We want our children to know that wellness is possible, that there is hope, that people get better, that people thrive, uh, and we do that by telling them how we manage our, our, our health, who's helping us, um, that you're focused on the family, not just yourself. And an important message is, you know, even if I'm not feeling well, I want you to feel well. My illness is not your responsibility to fix. It's not your problem to solve. And then the last piece is that we want to address stigma and, and shame. It's pervasive. Uh, we see it in the media. We hear about it you know, on the news. 
kids talk about it. In my experience, you know, mental health is maybe one of the last bastions of highly, highly stigmatized uh, reaction from, from people. I think we've normalized in a lot of other areas that were stigmatized, you know, gender relations or sexuality. Mental health still has uh, a strong stigma. And so we need to let children know and acknowledge that we're aware of it. And it's really nice to be able to sometimes share that you feel and experience that stigma as well. So what have your experiences been? That'll help things. We normalize mental health by talking about it, making it less of a big deal and more of an ongoing kind of conversation, um, and we get more comfortable with it over time. We, dump, we debunk myths. We, we talked about that. Research has shown that terminology or language is important, but to make the biggest impact in stigma, it is to put faces to the issue, in this case, mental health. And what we mean by that is identifying people that have mental health conditions themselves, letting our children hear from them or see them, meeting with them in person if ever possible, reading about them. We're making it real. It's not just something on the news, but it's something that affects real people in our lives. For some kids, a good starting point is to point to celebrities and say, did you know um, about the, the celebrities that may have made their, their mental health condition you know, known. Um, it's a good starting point, but you know, they're afar. They're, we're, we're not all celebrities. So we want to bring it into our normal everyday lives. And then lastly, we want to work with our kids and brainstorm responses. What happens if the neighbors are taunting us or you or me about our mental health? How can we respond to those things? There's, there's lots of strategies. It's maybe a conversation for another time, but by working on it together, you're working through the, the challenge of stigma itself. And finally, you want to wrap it up. These should not be long, long conversations. Again, they should happen over a series or period of time, ideally over a lifetime. You do them in small chunks. Some days you're successful, some days you get uh, pushback from your kids, some days they approach you. But you think through what are the messages I want my child to know, how can I help them grow from that, and those are the talking points or the touch points where mental health and our own mental health becomes important. Always, I always end with a hug and I love you and I'm proud of you and this is a really big step for us. Let's go get some ice cream or something to eat or go watch a movie. We don't have to talk about it today anymore. And I really think if you've gone this far, and I hope you do, that you've congratulated yourself because this is a daunting, challenging, and unbelievably rewarding process to bring our children into our lives in an honest and open way. And that's really what this is all about talked about language. I, I won't go into it too much, but we have a choice with language. We can choose words that hurt. We can choose words that, that harm um, or that heal, and it's really up to us. I have a template or a uh, document that I'm happy to share that has different language choices and, you know, sort of strengths-based and positive versus perhaps stigmatized or maybe negative language. There's a copy of the um, uh, the Mental Health Journey Template, if you'd like one. Uh, there are books available for children, adults, and teens around parental mental health. There's not a lot, but there are some. They're listed here, and we can get you a copy. There's a tool that we use in identifying uh, social supports for our children in figuring out what the protective factors are. I can make that available. There's the language tool. And you are welcome to reach out to me personally. My email is evan at childfamilyconnections.org. It's evan at childfamilyconnections.org. And if you have questions or want information about these tools, please do. I will respond. And, um, and I hope that we get a chance to connect. And lastly, I just want to thank everybody for, for an opportunity to share these ideas with you 
and promote a topic that doesn't get a lot of attention. And I really congratulate you for taking a step and, and, and for taking time out of your day to, uh, to participate in this, in this call. So thank you. Evan, thank you thank so you, much for this very important and powerful presentation. I feel like I've learned a lot, and I really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to go ahead and open up um, this for questions to our audience. And like I mentioned at the beginning, if you have a question, please go ahead and type it in the dialog box in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. And then I'll share those with Evan, and he will respond to them. Um, also, to all of our participants, you do have Evan's email. You're also welcome to reach out to me here at DBSA, and I can connect you to Evan and share other resources that we have here in the office as well. So if you can't uh, remember the email or you're not sure, I can definitely connect you and happy to do so. So while um, some individuals are typing, we do have one question um, that was typed in already. It was a little bit earlier on, so there might have been some answers that came up, but I do think it's a great question for you, Evan. And that is, how do you talk to your kids about your mental health condition without scaring them? That's a great question. Um, and, and that is something we need to be very careful of or careful about. It's very helpful to speak with an educator, especially when we have young children. But we, we should be talking to kids at all ages. We have to pick words and concepts that are age appropriate. So for example, if we're talking about uh, young children, you know, maybe up to the age of three or four, and I'm not a development uh, expert, but young children, we can use tools like books or games um, as a way of making it sort of an open, friendly, age-appropriate kind of conversation. With older kids and middle school kids and high school kids, we can use more um, specific and maybe more technical and more factual information as opposed to more conceptual. With younger children, we really need to think about who our children are as well. Where are they emotionally and developmentally? and what's going to work for them individually. So what works for my daughter, who's fairly mature now for a 16-year-old and always has been, may be different for somebody else's 16-year-old. I'm glad you asked the question. There's not an easy answer, but there are specific things that you can do. Um, reach out to me, and I can, I can share a little bit more information about that. But if you feel stuck and you're not ready to move past that point, Ask for some professional help, someone who understands child development, and they can really help you formulate some ways of conversing and sharing information. That's great. Thank you so much, Evan. That's a really great advice. Um, another question is, how um, would an individual connect with another parent who's living with a mental health condition? Oh, I love that question. So that's the reason that we started Child and Family Connections, is that there were no opportunities where I am uh, or in the U.S. to do that. And I'm, I'm very saddened to say that there are only 12 or 13 organizations in all of the United States that deal directly with parental mental health. Um, it's dealt with in different ways, in different treatment facilities and different approaches but not dealing with it head on or having the conversations that, that you and I are having today. So there aren't a lot of resources. However, um, one that I'm aware of because it's ours, we have a program called Parent Support Group. It's a phone-based support group every Wednesday. It's for one hour and it's hosted by this parent, uh, Elizabeth Nesselrode, who is absolutely phenomenal and has her own children and her own mental health journey and she's a mental health professional and you can call in for free you don't have to register or anything else it's every Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern time and the phone number is 888-601-3515 888-601-3515 and you're welcome to come to Child and Family Connections website and get some more information or again, you know, email me or email Angie and we'll get you a, a flyer or brochure. Excellent. Thank you. 
Um, another question we have is, when gathering information to talk about mental health, where is a great place to find some of that factual information that we know is good educational info? Yeah, so I would, I would point you to the book suggestions as a good starting point. The internet is, is a, a, a great place to you know, do some research. I would do it with sources that you are comfortable with and that you know are reputable. A phenomenal place is to go to DBSA's website. And I'm sure you can connect with somebody if you have specific questions that can't be answered or aren't answered on the information that's available. But there's a lot of good mental health information out there if you're just looking for the facts and the figures. I'll help you and in in point you in the right direction as well. But that's Angie's Ballywick. I think she's the go-to person for that. Yes, absolutely. We also have an educational and informational line here at DBSA where someone can reach out to us and we'll connect them with information and resources related to mental health, specifically depression or bipolar disorder. And it's called our helpline and that's located on our website and I can also connect individuals with that resource too. Um, excellent. So I don't see any other questions, but we do have a couple of minutes. So if anyone is still typing, if you can you know, go ahead and finish that up and we can answer any additional questions that um, anyone may have. So I don't see any other questions, so that will end our uh, webinar for tonight. Evan, is there anything else that you wanted to say before we closed up? No, I just wanted to thank everybody for, for their time. This is a real honor for me to to be able to present this with, with DBSA. So thank you. And Angie, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Evan. We were delighted as well. And this is incredibly valuable information. And we're very thrilled to be able to work together and share such important information and resources. Um, to our participants, thank you again for attending and for taking the time. Uh, we are recording this webinar, as I noted, and we will have it posted online soon. Um, so thank you to all. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and close the webinar. Have a great evening.